Good evening, everyone. I'm glad you got here early so you could get you a good back seat. You look like really comfortable Baptists. Glad you're here tonight. Bless your heart. Matthew chapter 26. Thus it must be. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and the elders of the people. It wasn't the city police or the Roman army, it was the Jewish hierarchy, the chief priests, and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, and presented him like he was some kind of horrible felon. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were, were with Jesus, John chapter 18 tells us it was Peter, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? According to Google and the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, one legion contains six hundred thousand men so you figure it out 12 times 6,000 but how then shall the scriptures be full fulfilled rather that and here's our lesson title thus it must be in that same hour said Jesus unto the multitude are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. It's very interesting in verse 56 that it says the scriptures of the prophets must be fulfilled. And then it says this one little news item, all the disciples forsook him and fled. Go back to verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So here again we have it written. And Jesus speaks of it. It is written. And so when he brings this up in verse 56, that which was written came to pass, and at that moment all forsook him and fled. It seemed like the Lord would have mankind, especially his church, but all mankind, act out God's predestinated providences. That they didn't forsake him and flee until Jesus said, this is written, and he had told them, what was written and what would happen and when he mentioned the scriptures again they did do that but I want to center our thoughts on that phrase that last phrase in verse 54 thus it must be the book of James chapter 5 the fifth chapter of the book of James James chapter 5 and verse number 6. 
ye have condemned and killed. It says the just here. It's the same word translated righteous in verse 16 of this chapter. Ye have condemned and killed the righteous. And listen, and he doth not resist you. There is no resistance whatsoever. Amazing. John chapter 10. One of the good things in our life is the church. One of the things that have really caused us to be calloused concerning this particular subject is the church. We've heard it all our life. It gets to be somewhere around December, the end of the month, we start, start talking about Jesus being born. And we get to be somewhere around uh, Easter, uh, we start talking about Jesus dying. And we've heard this over and over and over. But have you thought that we have condemned the righteous couldn't have been if he did not yield to it how many angels could you resist not I couldn't resist a half of one but 12 legions with 6,000 per legion he could have called John chapter 10 Verse 17, and I wonder why we don't enter into this love that the Father has for him. Therefore doth my Father love me. Next word. Here's the reason. Do you love me? Oh, honey, you know I love you. Well, why do you love me? Well, you ain't supposed to ask me that. You know, just say, do you love me? And I say, yeah, and that's it. But he says, because, therefore doth my father love me, because, listen, I lay down my life in order that I might take it again. Because I'm going to voluntarily die, I can freely rise from the dead my father loves me for that now you can't get to the resurrection except somebody be dead and the Lord Jesus proved that to Mary and Martha in John chapter 11 at Lazarus tomb we believe in the resurrection as an event talked to us by the church yeah we know all this but why doesn't it move our hearts I am the resurrection and the life. Well, then that means that you've got to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Because except there be one that's slain and dead, there can't possibly be a resurrection without a dead participant. And he says, of all the creatures in all the world, I am the only one that can lay down my life and take it up again. Listen at verse 18. No man taketh it from me. It can't be taken from him. Then how are you going to get him to die? But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to to take it again. Thus it must be. Keep those words in mind. Now, how did he have the power or authority to lay down his life and to take it up again? Because this commandment have I received of my Father. The person of Jesus of Nazareth had this power to do this, and he derived it from the Trinity. As he was one with the Father, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
in that essence prior to creation could not die. But he became flesh, made like unto his brethren. And Paul said that's how he destroyed Satan's power over us. Through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And then delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. So he said, it must be that there, had, that there was a, a child born of a virgin. Man didn't do that. Man didn't bring me into my life, and man can't take my life from me. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up. And he said, don't you realize that if now, even with Judas here with all of his mob, I can pray to my father, he shall presently invade this world with 12 legions of angels and y'all would not even survive the hour. But I resist that. I have the power to do that. The Father always hears me and if I ask, he would give. But I have been entrusted with something unique. The Father loves me because in all those prayers that I went out before dawn from the presence of the disciples and communed with my Father, this is what we talked about. That I know who I am. And I know what I'm going to do. And I know it's not going to be easy, but I know that it's going to be pleasing to my Father and cause him to be satisfied with all the elect of God that are chosen in me by the Father. So I'm going to do this. Thus it must be. John 16. John 6. No, excuse me. I'm sorry. John 11. John 11 and verse 42. They take, he's at the place where the stone is, is rolled over there. And Jesus, uh, they took the stone away from Lazarus' tomb. Jesus lifted up his eyes in verse 41. He lost consciousness of the present surroundings as far as that which he was focused on, not literally losing conscious of it, but had an awareness of God. And he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Thou hearest me always. So... Don't you realize that I can now pray to my Father and he shall presently give me 12 legions of angels? Do you realize that eternity in hell would be the plight of everyone here tonight except one man who was spit upon, lied on, did not receive a just trial. Everybody that said they were his followers abandoned him, and he tread the wine press alone. Even God the Father turned his back on him. What would you give to somebody like that who would pay such a price just to keep our souls from burning in a devil's hell. And he said, thus it must be. Thank you, Lord. 
I'm glad you are determined that this must be. Well, you ask yourself, okay, God the Father can't take his life. God the Holy Spirit ain't going to take his life. The, the Roman government can't take his life. The Jews can't take his life. There's nobody in the world. No man taketh my life from me. I alone have the power to lay it down. Well, then, what caused it to click for him to say, I release my spirit? He, King James, gave up the ghost. That is, he released his spirit. And when the spirit separates from the body, that's death. What made him do it? The thing he said before he did it was, my God, my God. Mm. We did that to him. When the bridegroom closed with the church, she was in debt. She couldn't pay the debt. She didn't have anything to pay it with. She was bankrupt. The first Adam left her in this mess. Now the husband owes her debt. You marry her, you become responsible for her debt. So he doesn't say, my father, my father. Teach us to pray. Okay, our father which art in heaven. Can't do that now. I am at one with the church and her sin is a debt that she owes God. The transgression is so great there's nobody in this whole universe, heaven, earth, or hell, under the sea, or in the air, whatever, nobody can pay her debt but me. Well, when are you going to lay down your life for it? What makes you lay down your life? When the last relationship that he had always relied on, even from all eternity, was denied him, the forsaking of God the Father, he said, I don't want to live anymore. And he bowed his head. And he gave up the ghost. So he said, this must be. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm not worthy of that. I'm not worth that, Lord Jesus. But thank you that you had your father in mind as well as the church. John chapter 12 Verse 27, now is my soul trouble. You need to cross-reference that with Isaiah 53. He shall see the travail of his, not his arms with the nails in them, not his feet with the nails in them, not his brow with the thorns on them. He didn't see the travail of his side with the spear in it. He was looking at the travail of his soul. This is the soul of the God-man. And he says, now is my soul troubled. And you would ask me, what shall I say? Yeah, we want to know. What shall you say? Your soul is troubled. And you say you have the power to lay down your life, the power to raise it up again. No man can take it from you. This commandment have you received from your father. So, Yes, Lord, what's troubling you? What shall I say? This is my dilemma. Father, send 12 legions of angels. You say that's not what it says. We can connect that to Matthew 26, 54. I, I, my Father will presently send 12 legions of angels. Father, save me from this hour. And he says, this is my dilemma. But for this cause, 
came I unto this very hour. When God started the earth to revolving around the sun as he hung the universe in space, when that first movement depicted the, su the succession, and that's what time is, a measure of succession, when that first succession as that earth turned on its axis and went around the sun, that started time and it started exactly at the point it was supposed to to bring me to this exact hour. Nobody could keep this hour from coming. Nobody could halt the functioning of the universe for me not to come to this hour. And he said, we're here. He had prayed in John 17, Father, glorify thyself. And it was at the time when he said, mine hour, the hour has now come. This hour. Every tick and every talk of every clock for all the centuries had come down to this hour. Do you think he should not be troubled? How is it possible that he wouldn't be? Do you understand that he that is life is going to die? How can you kill life? But that's what's fixing to happen. Whew. What is the greatest thing you've ever uh, read about or heard about in the history of the world? Well, the explosion of Mount Vesuvius, if I say that right. No, it was the great flood of Noah. Well, it was it. It was this hour when God, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. Well did the sun refuse to shine and hide its glories in when God the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. Ooh. And yet you have power not to do it? Yeah. I'm the only one that can say I will or will not die. No man takes this from me. They can't do it. It's impossible. And Yet we hear you, blessed Lord, say this, thus it must be, yes. And we heard you say that and connect us with the awareness of the Trinity in your thoughts with one another and let us climb Jacob's ladder, which is Christ, connected it from earth to heaven and let us transcend our normal thoughts and say, you can call on your father and he shall presently send 12 legions of angels. That's possible. Yeah. And he says, but it's not probable. Because thus it must be. Did you thank God for your health when you got up this morning? Did you thank God for your breakfast? Did you thank God for your lunch? Did you thank God for peace and quiet? Did you thank God that your children and grandchildren are healthy? Ah, but did you thank Jesus that was determined and put the word must in this to govern himself in that which no other creature could govern him in. First mm -hmm. John chapter four.
Verse 5. The numbers are 4, 5, 6. 1 John 4, verses 5 and 6. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In chapter 3, verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Now that's said to a, a believer, a man or woman born of earthly parents with remaining corruption in them that has no ability of redemptive benefit for anybody else, not even their self. Can't save me, can't save you. But it says, 1 John 3, 22, Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So we see, dear soul, that these privileges are granted to us and in Jesus' example we learn to be careful what we ask for and trust and pray to God that our mindset and our heart's yearning would be those things that God said must be and not just flimsy little old Flatteries, that would be good if we had them and people could see how great we are. First John 5, 14. First John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything... Next phrase, please. According to his will. Not my will thine be done. You can add, as Jesus did. You can add, nevertheless, you let this cup pass from me if it be your will. You can wrestle with it. You can sweat great drops of blood, as it were, in agony over something that's going to require seemingly the annihilation of your person. But why would you want to keep your own reputation when he made himself of no reputation? Why do we have to be thought well of when Jesus never was? So we have to come to this cross-like attitude that Jesus had and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will he heareth us and if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him did God hear your prayer then you're going to get it. Our little brother got up here and gave his devotion last Lord's Day. And he said all prayers are answered. Some of them just you have to learn to receive no for an answer. How many no's have we got? And why do we get no's? Because we didn't ask it in his will. I can't stand in the presence of the slain lamb, much less the presence of the redeemed, resurrected lamb of God. I don't have the kind of nature that I think this must be in my life, dying with Jesus through grace, through death, reckoned mine, living with Jesus a new life divine. 
saying as the apostle Paul did, death worketh in us that life may work in you. The attitude of the cross is not ours. We have the attitude of practicing traditional religion. The person individual of the Lord Jesus Christ seems to be far from us. God have mercy. Second Samuel chapter 12. You know I couldn't go through a service without getting in Samuel, didn't you? Who was a man after God's own heart? David. David. After God's own heart. He, God said that. It's in the book of Acts. 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 7. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave them the house of Israel and Judah. Would you finish that verse for me? The house of Israel and Judah. Amplified says, I would have added that much again. The man after God's own heart was told, if you had wanted Bathsheba or another woman that bad, I would have found a woman for you. I would have given you and added to that you that much again. Look what all he lists. And the Lord Jesus went to the slaughter as a lamb that was dumb and he opened not his mouth and he wouldn't ask for it. Mm. Psalm 84 and verse 11. Psalm 84 and verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. All he had to do was ask, but he said, I shall not do that. Thus it must be. I must accomplish God's precious will. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, in verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for whom? You say, well, he, he could look down through the ages and see the glory of the church redeemed, washed in the blood. That ain't what this says. It says that there was nothing in heaven or on earth to encourage him except his own determination. Those he were was to die for were the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man, that is a just man, lives by the law. He treats his neighbor as he would treat himself. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Yet perhaps... For a good man, you know, one that just don't live by the law, but who is kind. He's a little bit different than this first man. 
this righteous man, he doesn't say what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. You know, we'll protect your stuff and my stuff too. You keep your stuff and I'll keep mine. We'll live by the law. But he says, what's mine is yours and what's yours is yours. This is a kind man. Cares about others. And yet, peradventure for a good man, a kind man, some would even dare to die. What's the first two words of verse 8? But God did what? Commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Honey, it's your sister on the phone. Oh, what does she want? Well, come talk to her. He picks up and she says, I've just been given some bad news. He said, what is it? He said, my kidneys are shutting down. Oh, sis, I'm so sorry to hear that. You can't live if your kidneys shut down, folks. But she said, you know, you got two kidneys. Where is this going? And I need to find a match. Okay, I got an extra. It mean your life. I'll give it to you. But that wasn't that in this. He was going to be cast into not only darkness but into the hands of the demonic forces. I cannot imagine what happened to him in the time of the grave. And he prays a, a prophetical prayer in Psalm 16 and verse 10, and he prays this to God and says, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor permit thine holy one to see corruption. He said, don't leave me there. And whatever you do, this holy humanity that you have birthed in the virgin's womb, don't let bacteria start breaking it down and it corrupting. That was when faith was born. He is the author of faith. He had to have faith in God. And that's his prayer. Psalm 1610. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Nor permit, permit thy holy one to see corruption. He had to trust God. And that's what he said. Into thy hands. I commit my spirit. And now he goes into that which the Trinity could never have known except the God-man had said, thus it must be. For I didn't come to this hour to ask for escape, but I came to this hour to fulfill the purpose that only I in all the universe could accomplish satisfaction of God, the redemption of all the elect, but the obedience of the Son of God to do that which he said, my father loves me because I keep his commandments. He did that which was pleasing to my, his father. That's what he said. That's upon which our entire redemption hangs. John chapter 15. And verse 13. What is the greatest love? 
Well, we don't have to have the philosophers or people of great sacrifices to try to debate or de deliberate. Here, the person of love speaks. John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. There's no greater love ever been expressed. And it was not for a righteous man. It was not for a just man. But it was for ungodly men. And I have power to lay it down. And this is the greatest love that there is. That no man taketh it from me. Rome didn't have the ability to kill me. That would have been an execution and there would have been no redemption. The Jews didn't have the ability to kill me. That would have been an assassination and there would have been no redemption. But how did he come to the slaughter? As a lamb. As a lamb. As a lamb is brought to the slaughter. Is dumb. He opened not his mouth and said, Father, send those angels. It would, it, they would have been there that fast. He would presently have said that. He won't do it. It all depends upon his self-determination. Do you ever enter into a worship and a praise and a thanksgiving to the only friend that you've ever had that had such self-determination that he would rather be dead in order that you might live. And then he says in verse 14, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. If I am voluntarily laying down my life and following the pathway of God's revealed providence as manifest to me by the Holy Spirit through the scriptures, then I am one of the friends for whom he laid down his life. Self-determination to do it for you. Henceforth, I won't call you servants won't look down on you. Henceforth I call you not servants, because a servant don't know what the Lord doeth. You keep my commandments, and therefore you're my friends, and that's why I tell you everything God wants you to know, is so that you can hear these commandments and keep them, and know that I lay down my life for friends. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ain't God good? Amen. Could you turn back to Romans 5 and let us finish out with this? In Romans 5... In verse number six, in our relationship to Jesus Christ, he died for us because we were without strength. Also in Romans five, in verse number six, Jesus Christ died for us as we were the ungodly. We were without God and without hope in this world, Ephesians 2, 12. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8, 
Our condition was not only that we were without strength and that we were the ungodly, but we were active sinners. First Peter 3.18, you don't need to turn there. It said he died the just for the unjust. The only creature, and I hate to say that, Lord, but I don't know how to say it. The only being in the entirety of, of life, of, in, of the creation, that was just, gave his life for the unjust. Why did you do that? Self-determination. Thus it must be. And then in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, not only were we without strength, not only were we ungodly, not only were we sinners, but in verse 10, we were enemies. You have any enemies? Have you ever in your life, be honest, you don't have to raise your hand or say it out loud or make any notation that you have ever been in this situation. Have you ever said this about anybody? I hate them. I hate to see them coming. I hate their old ugly face. I hate their clothes. I hate their nose. I hate everything about them. They ain't nothing but mean to me. and They make me feel like trash. Would you die for that person? Would you go to the grocery store and pay their debt, pay their bill? Would you make their house note for them, or would you take the food out of your cupboard and give it to them? That's what Christ did for me. You don't have to get in on this if you don't want to. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. And having made peace through the cross, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile, restore all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes, number one, alienated, and number two, enemies, in your mind, by wicked works, yet now hath he restored, reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. And how shall he present you? Holy, unblameable. Nothing the devil or your enemies can say will stick. Jesus Christ presents you to God the Father as without blame. You know you're not without blame. I know I'm not without blame. But he did such a good job that even as we were enemies, we are presented as holy and unre unblameable and unreprovable. You can't say anything against me anymore, Jesus Christ has made me holy. There is nothing that can be brought up against you, even though the devil is accuser of the brethren day and night before God Almighty. He can't say anything. It is You are unreprovable in his sight. Woo, Jesus did a good job. Amen. And you know what Jesus said? If your enemy thirst. Because you was hungry and thirsty, and you was my enemy. Friend, listen, don't present yourself to yourself as some little sanctified little Sunday school student before you got saved. You're lying on yourself, and you're cheating yourself as a relationship with God. We was ungodly. We were sinners. We were enemies. We were without strength. And Jesus paid it all let's finish by reading Romans 9, no not Romans Revelation 19 
Revelation 19, verse number 11. Romans, why do I keep saying that? Revelation 19 and verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. In his righteousness he thus judge and make war. He's not interested in men dividing up and fighting one another. The Germans versus the British or whatever. He's determined to make war and judge according to righteousness, an entirely different realm. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he just got through telling you that everything he knows, he's going to tell you, so you know his name as well. For the next verse tells you what his name is. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, remember those angels that he could have called? You remember he said they, if he asked the Father, God would presently send him 12 legions of angels. Here comes an army with him. He didn't call for an army then, but he's going to come back with an army. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen. And we know that the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, Soul of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that with it he should smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vestures and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The Lord Jesus Christ, he said, in Matthew 22, that when those citizens didn't respect him, he shall come with his armies to destroy them. Sent forth servants, tell them that are bitten, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. Matthew 22, 5. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully, spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. It says in the next verse, those who were bidden were not worthy. He didn't call an army from heaven. And I remember one arm, one angel slew some 30,000 of the enemies of God at one time, just in one night. What in the world would 6,000 times 12? That's 72,000, isn't it? No, I forgot to add all the zeros. It's 72 with a whole string of zeros. What in the world could they have done? But he didn't. He said, thus it must be. Old song said, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. But when it's all over, he's going to come with that mighty army from heaven. And I don't want to be one who never bowed my heart and my head to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, thank you, Lord. I am a sinner. I am an enemy. I am ungodly. I am unrighteous. Everything your word says about sinners, I own it. But 
I plead the blood of the Lamb of God. And I want to thank you, bowing and kissing your precious feet, that ever you walk down the cards of my heart and said, thus it must be. Yeah.